This podcast is sponsored by Rask Invest, my guide to money and investing on the ASX and globally. To learn more about Rask Invest, follow the link in your podcast player. Don't forget that in November 2019, the Rask team and I will be hosting investor events in Melbourne and Sydney with lots of great guests and giveaways. The events are sponsored by our friends at ShareSite and Strawman.com. In addition to the evening events, I'll be hosting up to 20 DIY investors for intensive one-day investing research and valuation workshops. If you want to learn the nitty-gritty of investing in businesses, follow the link available in your podcast player to learn more. Welcome to the Australian Finance Podcast, a podcast for people who want to learn more about their personal finances and get the most from their money. This series is hosted by Kate Campbell from How To Money and Owen Raskovich from Rask Finance. The Australian Finance Podcast is provided for educational purposes only. The information is general in nature and does not take into account your needs, goals or objectives. What that means is the information does not apply to you specifically. So consider getting the advice of a licensed and trusted professional before acting on the information. Okay, Kate, welcome back to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. Yes, and we're talking all about Owen's favorite man in the world. Warren Buffett. (laughs) With two Ts. With two Ts, that's right. We've got um, a topic that's uh, about an individual. I don't think we've had a topic about a single person. No. No. And it's probably fitting too because he's often called the the world's greatest investor. Mm. So um, um, we'll, we'll dig into who he is if you've heard his name around but you don't know exactly what he's about, we'll, um, we'll fill in the blanks. Yeah, and talk all about what the big deal is about Warren Buffett. Mm-hmm. And then we've got some quotes and we might just, um, I guess, shoot the breeze and some of those quotes and what they might mean and some of the lessons we can draw from them. Mm. And that's going to be the episode. So I'm yeah. keen to get into this. Kate, why don't you tell us who is Warren Buffet? <laughs> Well, he's a investor in the US that has a company called Berkshire Hathaway. Well, that's listed now, so he doesn't own all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but he is well known for being a famous investor and buying many companies at uh, good prices mm-hmm. um, and sort of investing in that value investing style. Mm-hmm. And that's the idea that you buy things for less than what they're worth. Mm. Yep. Which is probably easier said than done, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, w- when I was reading on the weekend, he's worth around 82 billion US uh, sort of mid this year. So he's uh, the, the third wealthiest person in the world, though that um, the top five apparently fluctuate depending on whose investments are up at the moment. Yeah, that's it. The, the, the stock prices of the company that they started or that they own it largely depends where they end up on that list. Yeah. So he's sort of a bit different where he might not actually just, we might just buy a few stocks in a company we like. He'll go out and by the company. That's it, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the big difference is that he does own individual positions. Like he's mm. owned Apple shares, for example, or uh, Coca-Cola shares. But he also has the ability to buy entire companies because he mm. has his own business, which is worth more than $400 billion itself. Yeah. So he can use that money to go and buy other businesses outright. Mm. And what the share price for the Berkshire Hathaway stock? I'm going to look this up in Google as we speak. One share of Berkshire Hathaway's number one stock, which is there's two different ones, mm. the cheaper one and this more expensive one, is three hundred and eleven thousand US dollars, which so is pretty insane. So if you had one of these shares in your portfolio, you'd need three hundred and eleven thousand mm. dollars. You can get the slot. The, che- the cheaper one is for, to fill in the blanks for people that don't understand what's going on. The cheaper version of the stock is really just the main one broken up into more pieces. Mm. So you can still buy one or, one or the other depending on how much money you have. I think it's more of like a, a status thing to buy the more expensive one for 311000 <laughs> Saying you own a unit in that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, I mean, the most it. expensive stock in Australia is only a couple of hundred dollars. Yeah, that's it. And that's in Australian dollars. So, yeah, the mm. 311000 would be over 400 in Australian dollars. 400000 I mean. Okay, so let's talk more about Warren Buffett. He is called the Sage of Omaha, which is the, the place that he's from. Mm. Um, he's, he's been in the same house for like 30 years. Yeah, he's, <laughs> yeah I, think almost, I think it's all of his life he's been there. Or, well, he moved around. He um, moved away for work and for study and then came back to Omaha, Nebraska. But um, perhaps, Kate, you can just fill us in on some of the, the, the steps in his life that are important from his early childhood and some of the mm. things that people have pulled out from his journey as like defining moments. Yeah, so 
researching him, he's been always been an entrepreneur from paper runs when he was a mm. boy to I think that one of the interesting stories I read about how in his senior year of high school, he and a friend actually purchased a pinball machine um, at for $25. And then they not only had the pinball machine in the school, but they also had it in other locations nearby. And within months, he owns multiple pinball machines at different locations and then is able to sell the business for $1,200 um, a year later. So he's uh, been entrepreneurial from a very young age and finding ways to take a small business idea and turn it into something really big. Mm. And the thing about Warren is that – I'm looking at me using first names. Uh, <laughs> the thing about Warren Buffett is that he started very early. Mm. So that's probably – you know, we talk about how he's done amazingly for his investors. I think he produces an annual letter that goes out to all of his shareholders or just anyone that has an internet connection and we'll put a link in the show notes. <laughs> but, he, you know, we know him because he's – returned something like 2 million percent mm. or something outrageous for his shareholders in that time. But some of the things that we don't know, it's not touted very often, is how long he's been investing. So you just mentioned starting at a young age. I think he bought his first share when he was 11. People mm. are going to probably write in and say that's wrong, but I think it was when he was 11. And by the age of 30, he was a millionaire. So, and that was what it, it was goal I read um, that he declared in his early 20s he was going to be a millionaire by 30. Mm. And that's not a millionaire now where you have like one or two properties and you seem to have done well from a house in Sydney and a house in Melbourne. Yeah. This is actually from someone, you know, many, many decades 60, ago. 60, 70 years ago? Yeah, yeah. How old is he? In his 80s? Yeah, he's in his 80s, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, that's a pretty impressive feat in itself, right? Mm. But then if you fast forward to now, it works out that he made more than 99% of his money. And we've talked about this before. He's made more than 99% of his money after 60. Mm. So if you just think about that, he was already wealthy back then, but thanks to compounding, he's become extraordinarily wealthy, but only after many years of compounding. Yeah, it didn't happen in the first few decades. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So he's, got, he's, let, he's not only been a good investor, but he's been a good investor for a very long time. Mm. And so when we ask just how popular Warren Buffett is, We've got in the notes here that, and this comes from The Motley Fool, that around about 40,000 people go to the Berkshire Hathaway annual meetings every year. So if you own a stock, you can go. Yep. So a lot of people just buy one one unit of the Class B stock just so they can go to the annual meetings and they travel all over the world to see him mm. for a few hours speak. Yeah, and you can... He, he, he has a long-time investing partner called Charlie Munger who's brilliant in himself and mm. a fellow billionaire, but... He's, he's already given away most of his money, but you can watch it on Yahoo Finance. They do a live stream of the meeting every year. And I think not the one just gone, so not 2019, but 2018. When I looked at it within the first couple of months, it had 17.5 million views. And this thing's, you know, it goes for like nine hours. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a pretty not long like day. it's a cat video or whatever. People it's, queue outside to get in. It's yeah. like, X factor on steroids yeah. and for investors. And that's because, Gate, he, he's telling people, thousands of people in the stadium and millions of people watching exactly how he does things, why he does things. That's probably the most important thing, why he does things. All the lessons that we're about to get to, some of them, all the lessons. Every time he speaks, both maybe less less so Charlie Munger, but every time Warren Buffett speaks, it's he wants you to learn. And so that's, I guess, the reason why people go to see him, the reason why people pay attention to him. Um, and we talk about all these free yeah. resources that you can find online mm -hmm. to kickstart your own investing journey and you don't have to pay a fortune to get good quality information and people like Warren Buffett and quite a few of the other really wealthy investors that have done well provide all this information free to the public mm. to access through his um, his letters that he provides. So we'll link to that in the show notes and through his um Annual meeting. Yeah. And any speaking gig he does pretty much. Almost every one of the big shot investors that I interview have said that reading Warren Buffett's letters is pretty much table stakes, as in mm. you have to read that to understand how investing works. Yeah. And you can go and get them. They're free. You can go and print them off or you can, I mean, I, you can do what I did. I printed them off, but then I also wanted to get the 50th <laughs> year anniversary book. And I went and got a book that's got all 50 years of it together. And you can just get this stuff for free or virtually for free and it's from the best investor in the world. I mean, what more do you want, mm. right? So 
Um, that's enough about him, I guess. Let's talk more about some of the rules that he has. And Kate, you're going to kick us off with probably the one that he's well, not he's most famous for, but it's one it's one of his most popular by a long way. So can yeah, you tell us what it is? so one of his most popular golden rules that you'll probably see in every article that's to do with personal finance and investing is rule number one is never lose money. Rule number two is never forget rule number one. Mm. And so this is an interesting rule. We were just talking off air, right? Yeah. What I find that one a bit weird to myself because like, when you're investing, you do lose money. Mm. But yeah. I think you had other thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it's more about the psychology of it because – if you think about not losing money, in the, that's your first goal, don't lose money. Mm. Because you know, like we know from maths that once you lose money, it's harder to get it back than it is to not lose it in the first place and just mm. go about your way. And I think what he's trying to say here, and this is my interpretation of it, is that first and foremost, focus on how you can lose and how, you, like what's the risk involved in anything you do. And then once you get over that hurdle, then you can think about the return. And you, you, you would see it all the time. You see it everywhere you go. People talking about stocks, they're like, oh, I bought this, you know, speculative thing that's, you know, it's going to go up tenfold mm. because lithium's amazing and pot stocks and <laughs> crypto and blah, blah. Well, maybe, you know, that's not the way to compound. Maybe the way to compound is to figure out what's the, the best way for me not to lose money but still make some. Mm. I think that's what that is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the way I think about it. Anyway, I'll, I'll read this one and maybe you can uh, spitball once I, once I deliver it. So we've got, <laughs> quote, someone sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree a long time ago, end quote. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I often think about that in my own life because yeah, buying a house might be a massive goal that you think is completely out of reach. But other people that have bought a house probably thought that 10 years ago. So it's mm. more about taking the first step now so you can sort of plant your tree and then have it in the future. So um, everything that people have achieved they're, they've achieved because they put small steps in 10, 20 years beforehand. Mm. And it comes back to that compounding, right? Mm. You've got to start today. And, you know, that's they, they, they say that the, this the old Chinese proverb that's the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the next best time is today. Yeah. To start. And, and that's so that's true it. when it comes to your personal finances. You might think there's absolutely no hope you can save $1,000. But if you don't actually put anything aside, then you're not going to ever save $1,000. Mm. But it's just... You've got to start with... You failed before you've even begun, right? If yeah. you don't even give it a shot. Okay, so the next one is... If you aren't willing to own a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. Yeah, wow. <laughs> um, it's pretty what, scary to think about owning a, one stock for 10 years. Yeah, and this comes back to the idea that you're owning a business. So being a value investor, you focus on businesses and you value businesses. You're not buying just things that go up and down on a, on a page or on your phone mm. or whatever and what is and he's got another quote further down which um is if it's the effect that oh well, this is what he says he says quote i never attempt to make money on the stock market i buy on the assumption that they could lose them uh, lose the market the next day and not reopen it for five years mm. and so these two kind of go hand in hand it's to say that investing in shares is a long-term thing and what he's focused on is the business he doesn't need a share price chart or a, an app to tell him what his companies are worth because he has his own valuation, his own mm. knowledge of the business. And so he's not going to buy something just based on what a chart tells him to yeah, do. Or, or the media hype. Or what his friends mentioned to him. He's got his own opinion on what it's worth. And I think that's, that is really well encapsulated in that, that, those two quotes. Okay, so, and this is, this is to that point, Kate. I'll read it. It's, quote, when we own portions of outstanding businesses with outstanding management, our favorite holding period is forever, end quote. And when he says we, he's obviously talking about he and Charlie or mm. Berkshire Hathaway. So what does that mean, do you think? Well, pretty much they want to they buy pieces of a good company. And I mean, if it's a good company, you don't need to sell the stock. If, mm -hmm. if it continues to be a good company and it's growing, then mm. you can hold that forever. Yeah, like he, I know, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, so I'm not going to quote it, but his original investment in Coca-Cola, which they're now, they're still one of the biggest investors mm. in the world in Coca-Cola shares. And this is the New York version of the Australian version. It's, I don't know what, it, I can't remember the figure, something like a million dollars for like every 10,000 that's invested yeah. or something crazy like that. And if you think about it, he bought that decades and decades and decades ago. It's probably paying more in dividends now mm. than he originally invested in it. And that's dividends every year. Yeah. So if you think about that, like that's just crazy. Um, 
the next one. Uh, an investor should act as though he had a lifetime decision card with just 20 punches on it. Hmm. So this is an interesting one. It's kind of phrased a bit funny, but yeah. we'll say he or she. Um, imagine you have, uh, you know, one of those, like a, like a coffee cup, you get yeah. like a loyalty card you get when you go and you get it from your favorite cafe and then you get to the 10th one, it's free. But imagine that instead you can only drink 10 coffees in your lifetime. Where would you drink those 10 coffees? Mm. And if you think about that, like shares, if you could only buy 10, which ones would you buy? And it, it's not, again, it's not so much taking it in a literal sense. He means just take your time. Yeah. Buy the things, the outstanding businesses or shares that you you want to hold for a long ter- period of time. And is it, is it Warren that says you only have to make a f- like do a few things right? That's that's Peter Lynch. So another oh, okay. great I'm mixing yeah. them all up as long as you don't do many things wrong. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So oh, he does, I mean, he has a very similar saying, but the one I think you may be calling on is from Peter Lynch who says you only need to get six out of 10 right yeah. to be a good investor. And that's true because as long as you don't, I mean, you could even explode in one, on one of them and then the other six do well and it could outweigh the loser. Okay, so um, this, this is a good one. I don't know if this is a <laughs> quote about life or about investing, but he says, quote, the most important thing to do if you find yourself in a hole is to stop digging, end quote. Yeah, oh. I think I was going in the life quote section as well. <laughs> he, um, he has a lot of good advice, not just in investing because you have to be a pretty switched on person to become a billionaire. You do, yeah. And I think, like, let's just take that from an investing analogy. Uh, from a, you could you could probably just say that if you find yourself and you've made a bad investment, that you could, shouldn't just keep making a bad investment. You shouldn't yeah. just, uh, as we might say, water your water your flowers, not your weeds. Yeah, and you you do see individuals and fund managers even in the industry that will defend their idea to the bitter end till yep. the company is in liquidation yep. or becomes insolvent or the chairman's con- convicted of fraud. Yep. Like they will, like it's knowing when to when to cut your losses essentially and mm-hmm. when to change your decision. Like you can change your decision. You might be wrong or the situation might change and it's just evaluating the situation and changing your mind. Yeah, I think, you know, that's just, this is this quote and it's good that it was in the life section because it touches <laughs> on so many other biases that we succumb to mm. in everyday life. You know, we always want to be the one that has the right answer. I think if you take it back to investing, it's you don't need to be the one that comes up with the answer. You just need to be right. You don't need to be the one that come up with the idea. Mm. Just be right. And I think to think like that, you have to just put all of your ego aside and just accept what it is. Yeah. You know, you may not be. There's no point for originality. So anyway, um, next one we have. The uh, one thing I will tell you is the worst investment you can have is cash. Okay, <laughs> he goes on to say. <laughs> Everybody is talking about cash being king and all that sort of thing. Cash is going to become worth less over time, but good businesses are going to become worth more over time. I think we've had this debate on the podcast before, a mm-hmm. well, discussion about, because um, I do hear, I've heard some people say that cash is king. and yeah, You have said that. Yep. Yeah. And the thing is with inflation, if you just leave your money in a bank account where it's maybe mm-hmm. getting 1%, your money's becoming worth less and less over time mm-hmm. that's pretty scary right yeah and i think so coming back to his other quotes about businesses before my take on this is it's so easy to become involved in what's going on day to day with share prices yeah horror stories in the news <laughs> trump this china that you know all these types of things that scare the bejesus out of you but if you believe that good businesses will still make money for many, many years to come, then you'd be crazy not to even think about investing in those businesses. Mm. And I think that's the difference here. Like businesses do make more money than individual people and everything else. And even when shit hits the fan, people still need to eat. People still need to buy things. Mm -hmm. People still go to work. Like the world keeps going. It does. And even no matter how dire it can get, you know, businesses have survived. And that's that whole capitalism. We're not going to get into politics, but it's like the capitalism... (laughs) mindset just you know that we use money efficiently and you can invest in those businesses and make more money and then some bad businesses might not survive and then there's businesses like kodak who yeah missed out on a massive change in technology yep but then there's businesses like netflix that have really good management and actually pivot at the right time Mm. in the exact right direction two fantastic examples there Kate. i like (laughs) it (laughs) okay do you want to read the next one 
Um, I think this is a big one, but never invest in a business you cannot understand. Mm. And I would just say never invest in anything you cannot understand. Yep. That goes for managed funds, ETFs, shares, everything, property, uh, buying off the plan if you're a property investor. Yep. I think yeah. That's just a and we recently spoke to Nicole Haddo who mm-hmm. wrote Smashed Avocado and she her big point was doing so much research. You've got to do your research and you've got to understand it. Like at, at the moment, I'm not in a position to buy property and I don't understand how it all works and all the different fees involved. But if I did want to, I would want to fully understand what I was doing before I invested in it. No, I think that's a good point you make. You talk about fees there. When we say understand something, we don't just mean, um, you know, this is the business, this is what it does, or this is the ETF, this is what it does. Yeah. I think price will be X in whatever years. I like watching it, movies. Yeah, <laughs> that's it, yeah. Yeah. Um, we mean like thinking critically about the risks, mm. thinking about, you know, if it's a share, who's running the company, thinking about if it's an ETF, what would this ETF do if, you know, what would I do if this ETF fell 10%? Would I still feel mm. comfortable owning it? And that's just being smart because no matter what you think, you can't change the price. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what you think. It's what the actual business or the ETF does that's important. Mm. So and I often people say like the market doesn't care about your feelings. Yeah, like you might it. think it's amazing, but... Yeah, try convincing all the other investors in the world <laughs> to put their money into it. Uh, and, and he... He's got another quote, or it's just an idea, which is this circle of competence. So invest mm. in things that you know. Um, you obviously want to be as close to the center of what you understand. So that doesn't mean you go and, if you're a carpenter, you don't go and put all of your money in investment property and then all of your money in property stocks or property ETFs. Like you still need to diversify and you still need to mm. expand your circle of competence, but definitely don't put all your money into something you don't understand. Okay, and this is a fair, we just should have mentioned this next question anyway. Quote, risk comes from not knowing what you're doing, end quote. Definitely. There's mm-hmm. there's always risk that you're going to have with any investment that you can know about that you can't necessarily mitigate. But there's also a lot of risk when you just jump into buying a stock because your friend tells you about it and you don't know anything about stocks or buying shares and you have mm-hmm. no understanding of the business. So there's definitely another, I think, your personal risk if you don't know what you're doing you're just adding onto all the existing level of risk that investments carry. Totally. That's an an unnecessary thing. If you don't know what you're doing, just don't buy it. It's the the quote we just spoke to. Um, Kate, next one. Um, Investors should remember that excitement and expenses are their enemies. So if you're super excited about it, maybe it's not a great thing. Yeah. If it's got super high fees, again, maybe it's not a great thing. Yeah. So you might encounter excitement if you're talking about speculative stocks. It's okay to have some. As we've talked on the podcast before, you might have some, but you might not have any. Um, But if you're going to own these businesses and exchange traded funds and properties for a long period of time, the excitement wears off. So you've Mm -hmm. got to make sure you've got something good underlying Mm -hmm. that you're happy to hold for a long period of time once the initial honeymoon is over. Totally. And with expenses, we've talked about superannuation, managed funds, all those types of things. Keep fees down. Yeah, they just eat away at your, your future, so do not... Uh, and fees are usually something you can control. Yep. And especially with super, check what fees you're paying. Yep, just log into your account, get your annual statement, have a look, shop around. Okay, the next one is, quote, keep things simple and don't swing for the fences. When promised quick profits, respond with a quick no, end quote. Yeah, absolutely, and that's probably talking about a lot of the media and the trends where people are just jumping from trend to trend. And mm-hmm. Yep. And, you know, I think this is also true to the extent that, you know, we, we do talk a lot about ETFs on the show. Mm. Some podcasts talk a lot about property. It's important that, you know, we uh, have broad horizons and we're not necessarily focused on what's happened this year, the last five years, or even the last 10 years, mm. and do keep a check on our behavioral biases that can come in mm. and you know just because a stock went up yesterday just because an etf did well yesterday doesn't mean it's going to do well tomorrow we always talk about this yeah yeah it's uh <laughs> and when promised quick profits respond with a quick no yeah absolutely yeah yeah as a thing there's no no free lunch don't fall for a get quick get rich quick scheme yeah, absolutely there's always a new one out there someone's always got some sort of scheme mm-hmm and to the point of ETFs, I think this last quote is so important because people mm. are probably sitting back, Kate, and they're probably thinking, Warren Buffett's this stock guy from America. 
you know, we're told stocks can be risky, I'm not an investor, blah, 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 blah. Well, he's got an idea for that too. And he's been saying it for decades. So yeah. what is it? So if you like spending six to eight hours per week working on investments, do it. If you don't, then dollar cost average your way into index funds and exchange traded funds where you just get a huge sample of the market yep. and you don't have to make that decision on which one are you going to buy. You just get the average of the market. Yeah. So Warren Buffett um, was a big fan of index funds, which was um, popularized by mm. Jack Bogle, who was the founder Gander. of Vanguard. And you know he's always said that if you're not an active investor, as in properly willing to commit to yourself, not yeah. just passing interest, but if you're not going to commit to it, just invest in an index fund. Go do something else with your life, effectively. Mm. And hey, 90% of people probably shouldn't be investing in individual shares. They should probably just stick with index funds. Yeah, and exchange traded funds are a fantastic way to do that. And mm. you can get perfectly awesome results by yeah. just using exchange traded funds. Yep. You don't have to be the next Warren Buffett to yeah. have a wonderful life. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You don't. Um, you know, uh, we've talked about before. There's different ones you can you can talk about using different strategies. You can use index funds. You can build a property portfolio while you're doing it. You can do whatever you like. I think this is just a really good default for those people that maybe aren't hands on. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the third richest person in the world recommends it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think he's. Right. Um, I think he said that um, when he, if he passes away that his money should be the money after the donations because he's leaving most i think 99 percent of it to charity but mm -hmm. it should be sold and put into just basic index funds and etfs for his family yeah so he's yeah so he's got the money that he's going to keep which is not much in the scheme of how much he has but the rest of it's going to go to charities and he's already told them how to distribute it how to invest it blah blah blah, yeah. blah. but yeah it's um yeah that that quote kind of encapsulates everything you need to know about investing mm. Uh, okay, so there's one last thing which doesn't come from Warren Buffett. Um, well, he's got this first quote. Well, so we'll, we'll read the first quote and then someone else has expanded on it. Yeah. Yeah. So the first qu quote from Buffett is, quote, we make actual decisions very rapidly, but that's because we've spent so much time preparing ourselves by quietly sitting and reading and thinking, end quote. And he's talking, again, he's talking about we make decisions. He's talking about he and Charlie Munger. And they're very famous for saying they spend all day reading books. Yeah. And so we've got another bit of information here from the Farnham Street blog. We've talked about this before, this blog. It's, I think it's brilliant. It's it really goes deep into ideas and makes you think about areas that you wouldn't really spend time thinking about or talking about on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Um, so definitely recommend it if you're looking to sort of think further about and deeper about topics. Mm. And this is written, the, the Farnham Street blog is written by a guy called Shane Parrish. And this is what he said in response to that quote about sitting quietly and reading and thinking. He says, finding the time to read is easier than you think. One way to help make that happen is to carve out an hour of your day just for yourself. It's important to think about the opportunity cost of this hour. On one hand, you can check Twitter, read some online news and reply to a few emails while pretending to finish the memo that is supposed to be the focus of your attention. On the other hand, you can dedicate the time to improving yourself. In the short term, you're better off with the dopamine-laced rush of email and Twitter while multitasking. In the long term, the investment in learning something new and improving yourself goes further, end quote. I feel like that's pretty much everything yeah. you, you need to say. <laughs> but he also wrote an article, um, I believe, is that from him? Yeah, um, it was, um, so it's the buff. The formula, what I was about to say, buffet. Yeah. Um, going to bed smarter than when you woke up. And it's just, he really expands that idea about spending an hour of the day investing in yourself, whether mm. that's in learning something new, working on a hobby with your side hustle, like whatever it is, like work on yourself and invest in your own, your future and your education. Yep. And that's just a really good idea. Go to bed smarter than you woke up. Yep. It's great advice. You might not learn anything at your day job, but make sure you learn something before you go to bed. <laughs> yep, I like it. So, Kate, that was our wrap on Warren Buffett. We've got some great great quotes there. We're going to link to the show notes, uh, to his annual letters, just some yeah. quote pages. And I think just as a any investor, but especially as someone getting started, he's a great person to learn more about. Just a quick Google search or have a look on YouTube. People make fan videos for him. But um, 
and have a read about him, have a read of his company. He's very public about what he invests in. Mm -hmm. Um, Have a read of his free annual shareholder letters where he just drops his wisdom Mm -hmm. Um, and even just um, watch some clips from the previous uh, annual meetings. Mm -hmm. And next time you pick up a can of Coca-Cola or you see someone drinking one, just know that Warren Buffett owns part of that company. And Kraft Cheese as well. Uh, Yeah, Kraft Cheese, Kraft (laughs) Heinz. Um, He did have some ownership of Gillette, the razors. He owned part of Apple. Um, He owns heaps of these companies. When we're saying small parts, but he owns parts of all these companies that you know and use every day. Yeah. The greatest investor in the world. Have a look at his portfolio. He puts it online. That's it. Yeah, check it out. Okay, Kate, thanks for joining me. If people want to get in touch with us for questions or just reach out, where can they go? Uh, You can get in touch with me at HowToMoneyAUS on Twitter and Instagram and www.HowToMoney.online. Cool. And you can find me at Owen Rask on Twitter and Instagram, but also head to our website to lodge questions, which is raskfinance.com, and you'll find links to lodge questions there. Cool. Kate, thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening.